started just maybe I can get started here uh, just introducing introducing this. Um, so um, yeah, I first of all, I just wanted to say welcome to everybody um, about this event. Uh, my name is Derek Seidman. I'm a contributing writer for Little Sis. Uh, and we're really excited about this. It's our first Power Research History Hour. Uh, I'll introduce the topic and the speakers in just a minute. Um, but uh, first, I just wanted to introduce the group that's put in this event, Little Sis, uh, the opposite of Big Brother, also known as the Public Accountability Initiative. Uh, Little Sis is an organization that focuses on researching the corporate power structure, uh, both doing the research as an organization, but also helping others to do it, uh, either through trainings and research guides or through making available the littlesys.org database, uh, a power research tool that anyone can use to research powerful people and individuals. Also making available uh, our mapping tool, the Olagrapher, where anyone can make maps of, 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 of power networks. Um, and we'll be throwing a few links into the chat if anybody's interested in checking this stuff out. Um, also, I wanted to just emphasize that Little Sis is a movement organization with a focus on partnering with and supporting grassroots organizations, grassroots movements, grassroots campaigns, the struggles of workers, efforts to resist the power of Wall Street, of big tech, of big oil, and much more. Um, if you want to follow uh, what Little Sis is doing and connect with Little Sis, uh, you can sign up for our newsletter. You can follow us on Twitter or on Facebook. Um, look in the chat for some links. Um, but to, to segue, um, we're really, really excited for this discussion today with two of the original co-authors of the 1968 pamphlet, Who Rules Columbia? Um, as an organization, Little Sis has long been interested in and, and inspired by how power research has been used in uh, social movements in the past to support those movements. Uh, especially during the 1960s and the 1970s and into the 80s. Um, we published a few pieces on the role of power research in the civil rights movement uh, and in the movement against the US war in Vietnam. Uh, and a few years ago, I was at the Tamament Library um, in, at, at New York University and I was digging through the archives of an organization called the North American Congress on Latin America or NACLA, um, which is still around and doing wonderful work. Um, and I, in, when I was doing that, I came across this pamphlet called Who Rules Columbia? And it just completely blew my mind. Uh, I had known about the, the historic 1968 Columbia University student uprising um, when hundreds of students basically shut down, you know, one of the, the most prestigious universities in the world um, to protest Columbia's ties to militarism and racism. And this was, of course, one of the one of the iconic events of the of the 1960s in the U.S. But I didn't know that um, power researchers at the time had played a big role in supporting the student movement at Columbia and beyond, uh, and mapping out the university trustees, showing how the universities are, you know, larger key parts of the corporate power structure. Something that you know is really relevant to what a lot of student organizers are doing today. Um, and so, you know, that's what Who Rules Columbia did. It was really a, a masterpiece of power research that was produced during a historic movement moment. Um, you can read more about Who Rules Columbia in, in the story that we wrote, but also just looking at the original pamphlet, which is um, we link to in our story, and uh, maybe there's a link in the chat. Um, I wanted to also, I'll show you another, this is the cover of it. One of my favorite parts of Who Rules Columbia is this chart. Uh, that's in it. The top 22, Colombia's ruling elite, that really shows the different, the different sort of you know blocks of power among universities trustees that I'm sure uh, our speakers will talk about. But I want to introduce them now. We're really grateful to have uh, two 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 people who were there who were producing this pamphlet um, when all this was going on. First, I want to introduce Michael Walker. Um, Michael grew up on New York City's Lower East Side. Um, and he got involved in political work and research in the early 1960s when he joined the Students for Democratic Society, or SDS. 
Uh, he worked with Tom Hayden at University of Michigan on analyzing the, the military industrial complex. And he got involved in Latin America solidarity work after the 1965 US invasion of the Dominican Republic uh, he, in, in researching how the Dominican, Dominican Republic, Republic's economy rested on sugar exports to the US and how that industry what had very close ties to the Lyndon Johnson administration. And there's probably no coincidence that that invasion happened under Johnson. Um, Locker was one of the founders of the of NACLA, and which uh, and it, um, when when he was involved, it really specialized in in uncovering the power structures behind U.S. Latin American relationships. Um, he then went on to organize the Corporate Data Exchange, which focused on identifying the leading stockholders in the largest U.S. corporations. In 1982, he founded with Steve Abrick a consulting firm to help trade unions use power structure research in their organizing campaigns and contract negotiations. Uh, and really, you know, played a big role in uncovering how worker pension funds in particular support corporate power and how these those relationships can be used um, to influence corporate policies. And over the, the past 40 plus years, Locker Associates, um, his firm has worked with 20 unions, over 20 unions on over 150 projects. So a lot of experience using power research in service of the labor movement. Um, our, our other speaker is Fred Goff. Um, Fred grew up in Colombia in South America, uh, the son of Presbyterian missionaries who lived for 40 years in Latin America, uh, instilling in him a lifelong connection to the region. As a student at Stanford, he helped to organize resistance to the US war in Vietnam and also helped organize the university's participation in the Mississippi Freedom Summer uh, um, uh, in you know, one of the really iconic moments of the, of the Southern Civil Rights Movement. Uh, in 1966, a year after the US invasion in the Dominican Republic, um, Goff was recruited to be the coordinator in Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic for the Commission on Free Elections in the Dominican Republic headed by Norman Thomas, but he was fired for resisting its endorsement of the flawed election. Um, out of that experience, he helped to create the to create NACLA, the North, again, the North American Congress on Latin America, um, to analyze and to try to change US policy towards Latin America. When NACLA closed its West Coast office, he helped to organize its research library um, on the West Coast as the Oakland, in Oakland as the, the data center, which was focused on the U US political economy and really focused on using kind of, you know, power research resources to to meet the needs of grassroots organizers and journalists and academics throughout the country. Um, the data center, which has since closed, had, had files on thousands of corporations and its resources and methodologies were used in building organizing campaigns among domestic workers, tenant organizers, restaurant workers, farm workers, taxi workers, and more. Um, so really impressive. And also maybe the next topic for our next, uh, you know, power, power yeah. history post. But, um, uh, in any event, um, we're really thrilled to have both of you here. And uh, the way this will go is for the next, you know, half an hour or so, we'll have a little discussion. I'll ask some questions and Mike and Fred will answer. Um, and then uh, we'll have some time at the end, 15, 20 minutes for some um, audience uh, questions and uh, discussion. So um, I just also wanted to let people know that, we, that we're um, recording this. So just have that in mind if that's, uh, um, you know, any, any, any issue for you. Um, so uh, I want to just start off by maybe, and maybe I'll direct this to you first, Mike. Um, how did you come to be interested in power research in the first place um, in the 1960s, sort of setting the stage for who rules Columbia? How did you get interested in all of this stuff? Oh, um, I don't know. It, it really goes back to um, something I read by Jack Minnis of SNCC, believe it or not. He wrote a, uh, a little piece of work on power analysis for SNCC and the role of research. It was a stunning piece of work. I think he wrote it in 1964 or 65. And, you know, he made it clear that in order to have a good strategy for a movement and, and develop good tactics, you had to have solid research, uh, power structure research. In fact, the pamphlet he wrote on 
the care and feeding of power was on Birmingham, Alabama. A very fascinating piece of work. And I started uh, looking at this and actually uh, Tom Hayden recruited me to come up to the University of Michigan and uh, do some analysis, as you indicated, on the military industrial complex. And there's a long history actually of power structure research. We shouldn't think we invented this. Uh, it was really uh, done by uh, journalists and uh, people who have a Marxist persuasion or a radical persuasion all the way back. Uh, Anna Rochester did a wonderful book on power structure of the United States. Uh, Victor Perlow, a member of the Communist Party, did an interesting study on power in the United States, et cetera. So, you know, Tom gave me these books. I started reading them and they, they opened my mind up to a whole new world that there is a structure to power. There's a structure to the ruling class and we can be understood and deciphered. It's not mysterious. It's not unknown. It's not something that can't be uh, written about and explained and used in order to develop good strategy and tactics. Um, then there was C. Wright Mills, of course, who played a major, major role in our understanding of what was going on. And Mills, by the way, was not a Marxist, interestingly enough. He wrote a whole book on Marxism called The Marxist, where he sort of denies the fact that he's a Marxist. You know, he used Marxist analysis, but he was not a Marxist. He, he was somebody who understood classes, and he really understood the role of the ruling class. And of course, his works were denounced in the sociological profession. He, he had a great uh, part in, in, in making me a sociologist, uh, because he came at this from a sociological point of view. In any case, uh, uh, who rules, uh, you know, Mills's power elite was, was stunning. Uh, the other factors which led to the uh, use of power structure research and really led to who rules Columbia was the role of Rampart's re research. We were hired in the 1967 period to uncover the CIA connections to the National Student Association. And uh, that was a very important, I'm sure Fred remembers it, a very important uh, task for a number of NACLA people. They asked us to help on this research. They paid us to uncover the foundations, which was secretly funneling, funneling money to the, uh, to the National Student Association and to the whole cultural institutions of the United States, basically. And as you can see in Who Rules Columbia, that played a major role in what we wrote about. We have a whole section on the CIA, in fact. So those are the major, I think, uh, factors which got me interested in power research. Fred, you want to Talk about that a little bit also, maybe. You have to unmute yourself. When I was at a yeah. NL war conference, uh, I think it was in Cleveland. Uh, after I got back from the Dominican Republic, I was pretty, uh, pretty uh, dismayed by what had happened and how the Commission on Free Elections in the Dominican Republic had been used. And uh, he said, you should talk with Mike Locker. Uh, he's done a, some research on the sugar industry and its role in the Dominican Republic. And so he drove me up for that conference to Ann Arbor, where Mike was, and that's how we met. And one of the first questions he asked me was, uh, you know, a guy named Sasha Bowman. And I said, yes, he was the person I was, if I ever had any problem in the Dominican Republic, that he's one of the people that I should get in touch with. And this was told to me by Al Lowenstein, who was one of the uh, chief organizers of this whole Commission on Free Elections under Norman Thomas. So we started talking about uh, the sugar industry and actually wrote a, a whole long study. One of the first studies Knockle ever did was on the sugar industry and its role in uh, in shaping US policy towards the country. And uh, one of the other early Knockle staff, Proctor Lippincott and I did a big study on the coffee and sugar exchange and how the sugar industry is organized at Mike Locker kind of led us through uh, some of the ways of getting at the information we wanted. And I went to, uh, we went to Washington to interview the head of the 
uh, State Department Dominica desk. And uh, I, I said, well, we're here because we'd like to know the role of, you know, what, what role does sugar play in the Dominican Republic policy? And, and the, the uh, State Department guy said, there is no, that doesn't really, we have a whole methodology of how we do relations with foreign countries. And these corporate interests don't play any role at all. We just hit a stone wall. There was nothing we got, got out of it. And as I was leaving his office, I said, what did you do? How did you train for this? He said, oh, I'm a lawyer. And I said, oh, where? On oh, Wall Street. Oh, I said, what firm? He said, uh, Surrey Karras at Green and Gould. And I said, oh. And he turned to me kind of sheepishly and said, now you have your answer, don't you? And I said, yeah. And Surrey Karras is, is the chief sugar lobbying firm uh, on Wall Street at the time. And that was, having done that research, uh, really helped me understand power. I mean, that little story kind of helps. If you do the work and understand who it is you're up against and what what you're trying to change, it's a, it, it plays a very important role. That's what intelligence is. Intelligence is not about uh, uh, knocking off people clandestinely or something. Real intelligence is using information to give you an advantage in what you're trying to achieve. And that's, and, and, you know, DACLA and the data center were called intelligence hubs of the, of the new left. And it wasn't that we were, you know, nefarious. We were just trying to find out how things work in order to be where to apply the levers for making change. Thank you so much. One other thing, Derek, one other thing I should have mentioned was Dumhoff. Obviously, Dumhoff's work, which came out in 1967 on uh, who rules America, was a, was a very, very important crystallizing source of information on, on methodology and, and, tack, and, and how to approach the power structure. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, we're big, we're big fans of uh, who rules America at, at Little Sis. Um, uh, yeah, so that was really helpful in understanding how you both sort of got introduced to this world of power research. Um, so you're 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 in the power research, and you and, and you start NACLA in 1966, um, and then in the spring of '68, things are things are heating up at Columbia. It's 1968, really, you know, a year of revolution around the world. Uh, what um, can you talk a little bit about going into you know? Uh, into 1968, the Columbia student strike. Why did you decide to write Who Rules America? Can you just just uh, talk a little bit about the, you know, the discussion and the, and the thought behind that and the lead up to, to, to putting together Who Rules America, or sorry, Who Rules Columbia? Yeah. Fred, go ahead, you go first. No, no, you go, you go first. No. <laughs> go for it. Well, right? You know, we were very close to, we were situated in a small apartment building on 106th Street, 106th Street and Amsterdam Avenue on the top floor. And that's where NACLA had its headquarters. And uh, it was only about six or seven blocks from Columbia University. And a lot of us had connections with SDS and with people at Columbia. So it was quite, uh, you know, we got caught up. Mike Clare in particular, who was a student at Columbia, was in, in, in NACLA at the time. Also, if I remember correctly, uh, we got quite caught up in the uh, whole uh, takeover of buildings and the SDS involvement. I think the uncovering of Jason Kirk's files uh, really gave us the idea that we should do a pamphlet, maybe, or an expose on what the whole power structure of Columbia was about. Uh, basically, the students seized his uh, office and liberated his files. Uh, which were the board, a lot of files we had asked for and SDS had asked for and the students had asked for. What was the deliberations of the board of directors? Uh, what kind of uh, things were, what kind of grants were being made from the United States government to the school? Uh, were any of these grants confidential or secret? Uh, in other words, done by the CIA or the military. What military contracts were being done, et cetera. And in his files, a lot of that data, a lot of that information was liberated and uh, discussed. Uh, if I remember correctly, Fred, uh, 
uh, we had ac access to those documents. We also got access to some directories and materials that made our research a lot easier uh, because he had a collection of materials in his office, which we were able to use. Um, so I think that was the that was the major reason we we we, we struck up the uh, the work. And because Fred? they asked us to also, you know, could you help us, you know, figure out what's what's happening here? Uh, I was we did a lot of photocopying. Uh, that was one of the big, you know, either going to the math building to use the photocopier there or going to the copy shop, copy shop and photographing files from the from the office. Uh, I was assigned to protect Grayson Kirk's office and because there was people did not want to the strike committee did not want to have it to, to destroy it or to uh, disturb the the uh, there was a very very uh, valuable painting. I don't know if it was from Rembrandt or something, but you know maybe worth over a million dollars. They didn't want that destroyed. And and they wanted to try to be respectful of the uh, the office itself and mainly uh, be able to get at the files. And it was a real eye, eye opener, as Mike said. Uh, we also NACLA was cre the first support for NACLA and NACLA's first office was in Morningside Heights at the Inner Church Center. Uh, the, at the time, the uh, there was a there was a split in the power structure of the United States over, particularly around the the uh, Vietnam uh, the uh, Dominican invasion. Um, I was told that for the the first time that the National Council of Churches broke with the State Department was over the U.S. invasion of the Dominican Republic. And because of that split, there were there were leaders within the churches who wanted to try to understand this new dynamic. People from the field uh, were telling them, you know, you, we could not be supporting colonialism. We could not be supporting imperialism. Um, and they, the first NACLA newsletter was printed. In the Presbyterian office, right, very near Columbia University, and uh, and so, and my wife, who was also a staff a staff member of uh, of NACLA, was a student at UD Theological Seminary, which was another one of the institutions she had done a study for when the black students took over the office of the trustees at Columbia. I mean, at uh, Union, Union Seminary, uh, asking that the seminary make a donation to the Black Economic Development uh, campaign that Jim uh, James Foreman was heading up. Uh, that's a whole other story. I don't want to go on more. But at any rate, we were yes. part, part of the uh, Morningside Heights community in, in a number of different ways. Well, I was wondering. I'd, I'd add one more, point. one more point, Eric. I mean, it was very clear we were doing this to help the movement. Uh, we we under we had a methodology we felt we felt would help them understand who were they dealing with, what kind of power was against them, and how could they effectively deal with that power or try to push it back. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what some of what you were? I, I'm interested in the in the research process. You know how you put all this together, but maybe before that. When looking back on who rules Columbia and the power analysis that you did of Columbia University, what were some of the most, what were some of the things that really stuck out to you or the most striking things about how power worked at Columbia or how, you know, Columbia was connected to the larger corporate power structure? You want to go, go, go first, Mike? Sure, sure. Well, what what struck out, what struck me the most was how close the whole Columbia struck power structure was to the U.S. government and the corporations. There was no real separation. 
there was a there's a a legal separation, but in fact there was a very tight relationship of interaction and and deal making that went on between the private sector, the school, and the government institutions. Uh, we posited in that study that the university was primarily a uh, factory for producing uh, very important um, agents of supply uh, control for the uh, for the establishment and for this economic system, for the capitalist system, and for the worldwide economic system it was putting forward. That is, it was cadres of people they were producing. They weren't producing students for intellectual work. They were producing agents of control that they could uh, count on to make sure the institutions of the United States were preserved and, and benefited. And that, that's, that wasn't the, the role, that wasn't the way the university was portrayed. It was the way we put forward the, our understanding of the university based on the power structure that controlled it, not managed it, controlled it. We used a very, very important word, rules, not manage. And really what we were saying is the whole school was set up to support the system and not question the system. And when the students questioned the system, when the students became outraged uh, about the secret defense contractors, the takeover of land in the park, uh, the takeover of uh, buildings, et cetera, they rebelled. And how did they rebel? They seized property. And they said, we're not going to be ruled. We're not going to be used this way any longer. That's really what they were saying. They were trying to free themselves from this control. And, and that's the most important lesson, I think, that I took from the whole, uh, whole exercise. Um, you know, how professors and students are used by the system, knowingly or unknowingly. Some are conscious of it, some aren't conscious of it, to be honest. Uh, and the other thing we learned, by the way, from this uh, very important study was that there was insufficient information on the economic relations. Stockholder information was not something you see in the study. It is something now we have access to through the internet and through data collected by the government. You know, who owns an American corporation? Who controls American corporation? Was not something you won't see in the, in the study because as Dunhoff, I think, made cl uh, clear in a, number, uh, a study he recently I read, the economic data didn't really come into existence until much later. The social relations, the board of directors, who was on the school uh, social club, what religious institutions they were associated with, et cetera, that was available to us in who's who in America and uh, standing in poors, et cetera. But the, the power structure of stock ownership and bond ownership, which is very, very important, finance was not available to us. I don't really have much. I mean, I think that's very, you said it very well, Mike. Thank you. Um, I guess, you know, it would, be, it would be interesting to hear also how you put, you know, especially given that there might have been less information available about power back then. Um, how did, what was the, what was the process like? How did you put together this really, you know, amazing um, pamphlet, Who Rules Columbia? What was, what was the research process like and what sources did you rely on? A lot of index cards. Right. <laughs> yeah. a lot of how do you yeah. keep track of all this information we had no computer god guys we had no computers yeah. it didn't exist yeah. there was a mainframe computer at columbia which we didn't have access to but yeah. in any case we had index cards in fact we tried to develop a system of punch cards uh, a friend of ours uh, robert shapiro had developed a system where you had a card with holes all around it and you'd punch out in order to develop the relationship, you'd punch out the hole or the, the, the divider of the hole, and you'd put a pin through all the cards and you'd pull up the cards which had the associations you were looking for. That's index that cards, is what they were called. Yeah. 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 So, you know, one of the big challenges was how to keep track of all this tremendous detail. I mean, we I gotta tell you, one of the most important things about NACLA was documentation. We did not believe in rhetoric without documentation. We didn't believe in rhetoric, period. There's very little rhetoric in the, in the Who Rules Columbia. There's some, because we enlisted the help of a journalist to help write the uh, uh, journalist, an author uh, who wrote uh, nonfiction, Saul Urich, uh, a, a very famous author, helped us try to craft some of the language we use in order to give it a little more uh, excitement, because we tended to be very dry and factual oriented. 
for, from a, a training and orientation. We were very dedicated to documentation. We were not going to say something we couldn't support. We couldn't document. Is that, that true, Fred? How do you help? And not to, and to not make uh, the what the point that you're trying to make any heavier than the support that you could give it. I mean, it's to have the footnote. I have Stone was a big hero. Yes. Of mine. Uh, he he had the uh, I have Stone's weekly, and he thought that everything that you needed to know could be found in the newspapers and the congressional record and other public sources. And uh, I walked down with him once from his house down Nebraska Avenue to DuPont Circle. He bought 12 daily newspapers. We walked back mm -hmm. and in his house. He started tearing them up and uh, finally it, his stories. And uh, I think that was a real inspiration to us to uh, yes. to uh, organize, to gather and organize in the power of the footnote. It, we the footnotes that we used and the sources we used were not were, were mainstream what were known as mainstream sources and were kind of irreputable uh, sources and uh, I think another when you look at this chart I mean Mike Claire Michael Claire was trained as an architect and as an, and as an artist and one day his professor said to him you know look you're a, you're very good at architecture you have a great you know, pro prospects are great for you, if you, but you have to decide, are you gonna be an anti-war organizer or are you gonna be an architect? And so he decided he was gonna work for peace, and, but he gave his talent and he was the one who designed Who, who Rules Columbia and helped us fit things together in a way that could be, we could make the point uh, through, uh, how you organize the present the visual presentation? Yeah, I, I'd add I, the clippings, Derek, were very important. We we had files and files and files of clippings, uh, newspaper and magazine clippings uh, that were again. There was no online service. There was no Google. That's for sure. Well, uh, the, and we used. To... Go ahead, Fred. When the old Guardian was closing. They were going to throw out their whole collection of orchard magazines from the beginning. And so we rented a truck and went down and not only got Fortune magazine, but all their issues of the masses and a whole bunch of other periodicals. And we clipped every issue and had a file that, you know, was kind of in the era of today, you know, it's something you don't do, but. I think it was key to our ability to document and do that, do research and create files on hundreds and hundreds of companies. Let me tell you one story about C. Wright Mills and files. <laughs> uh, C. Wright Mills had quite a collection of paper files, and his his assistant was somebody called Saul Landau, a very famous guy who's done a lot of work on Latin America. Anyway, Mills every Christmas vacation. Asked Saul Landau to take all his files and dump every every content on the floor and reorganize it. Why? He didn't want to become frozen in the categories that the files created. Very it's, interesting, and he was right. They he was right. Third interest. Yeah, it's really inspiring to hear just the rigor and the meticulousness that that you that, that you were uh, you know approaching the research with. Um, we we have a few minutes before we, uh, I want to turn us to you know so, some questions from other participants in in in, in, the, in the Zoom here, but um I wanted to ask you so you you know you you put all of this work into producing Who Rules Columbia, um maybe we could end with with two questions. One, um you know how was this how was Who Rules Columbia and the sort of the model of Who Rules Columbia used at the time to support organizing efforts that were going on. And then also, what do you think, what, how do you, why do you feel about something like Columbia Power Research? Why is that still relevant today for, for, for organizers today? So maybe I'll pass well, I think the most, 
The most important legacy, in my my estimation, is uh, corporate campaign, corporate uh, corporate uh, campaign research, uh, corporate power structure research, which is done by trade unions. This whole technique that we started and developed, uh, we developed, we we worked on, uh, has morphed into uh, corporate power research in the labor movement, which I've played a role in and that I've been part of. I think that's just, there isn't a major union in the United States that's not have or utilize corporate power research today in its organizing or its collective bargaining process. And it took us uh, 10 to 15 years to get the labor movement to be aware of this. Uh, I went to many unions with the idea that they should make use of this, the uh, UAW, the steel workers, et cetera. Oh, Mike, we don't need this. We're, we're fat and happy. We, we have a very good understanding of power and we, we don't really, not until 1978, 77, 78, when Jack Shankman, who headed the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers Union, and he was fighting the J.P. Stevens campaign, did he turn to me and say, Mike, we need a help in understanding the power structure of J.P. Stevens and how we can get them to the negotiating table and do a contract. They had 10 plants organized. That is, they had elections where the 10 plants had recognized the union and they didn't have one contract. Very similar to Starbucks, by the way. Too, too similar to me to, to, to be frightened by. And Jack said, what can we do, Mike, to get them to the table? Well, I said, Jack, I think I can do it. We did some research. We found an insurance company which was financing J.P. Stevens. It was, was interlocked with Stevens. I went back to Jack and I said, Jack, you know what you have to do? You have to call, you know, the head of the uh, this, this insurance company. Oh yeah, I know him very well. Go to lunch with him all the time. So I said, well, call him up and tell him, look, if you can't, and, and J.P. Stevens, by the way, was on the board of this insurance company, okay? Uh, so if you can't get J.P. Stevens to meet with you and negotiate a contract, you're going to have to reconsider what you're doing with all your pen pension and health care money, which is locked into this insurance company. What do you think happened? He got the meeting. He got the meeting. So the J.P. Stevens, you know, there's a lesson here. You need the organizing at the base. And you need the understanding of the power structure to affect the company's decision-making process. That's the most important lesson. And I think that one of the, in this book that I think I showed you, The Death by a Thousand Cuts by Gerald Mannheim, he says it there that uh, he thinks that NACLA was the originator of the, uh, corporate campaign. I think Mike referred to it, the J.P. Stevens campaign. But in this book, he has scores of uh, little profiles of the corporate campaign since then. So that's one, one, uh, one legacy, I think. Another one is uh, Mike Clare has just, Mike Clare is now uh, a retired from uh, teaching at Hampshire College, uh, but he's on the Arms Control Association. He's a senior research fellow there. And he is also the uh, military editor for uh, Nation Magazine. And he's just, one of his recent articles was the Pentagon's quest for academic intelligence. And uh, he has created a new database of the research being done at universities today on uh, for the military, millions of dollars worth of uh, organized by university. And if anybody wants to take this up, I mean, like uh, here in, in Berkeley, uh, talking about weapons of mass destruction, uh, UC Berkeley uh, for many years managed uh, the Lawrence Livermore lab, uh, where which arms every single nuclear arm in, in the United States, uh, every weapon of mass destruction. At any rate, I think that there are a lot of applications of what we. Mike, do you want to say? Well, you. I don't want to take more time. Derek, ask the next question. Um, if, if there's one, if there's one, if you want to just just say something for another two minutes, that's fine. And then we can move on to. Mike, could you tell that story that you sent me the article about about 
which blew my mind of the now the labor leader, a uh, labor researcher who's going to Harvard Business School. Remember that? I don't remember the story, Fred. Which story are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, Maybe, let, me, let me say let me say two other things though, Derek. One, we didn't study conspiracies. We didn't study conspiracies. We studied structure. And one of the problems today in power structure analysis is looking for the conspiracy and not looking enough at how the structure enough is the conspiracy, if I can put it that way, if you understand what I'm saying. And second of all, I wanted to say the, 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 the crucial role of power structure research in, the, in developing a movement, an effective movement, is really an important lesson. You need to understand the power structure in order to develop a strategy and tactics, which is effective. Very, very important. And research is the way you understand it, not through just action. Research is really an important component to lead action. Third point I'd make, one last point. The power structure analysis, which has always interested me, is how has the economic structure influenced the political structure? Obviously, the United States has gone through a major set of changes in the power structure which has led to Trump and led to the phenomena as we have today in the American political system. How is that power structure in the United States reflected in the political changes? That's still a mystery to me and I'm working on it currently. There's one other uh, piece, one other little thing to add. We also had the help of people inside the system who saw what we were doing and said, I wanna help you. Like uh, there was someone who really understood the real estate in New York City. And he said, I'm not gonna be public. I'm, I don't wanna be mentioned, but he helped us understand that whenever you do this, if, if they see that you're doing, you know, it's not rhetorical, it's well, well researched, that your facts, you got your facts together, people start to come out and help you uh, and uh, help you develop. And, ways that you could even have imagined thank you these are these are really wonderful insights and and lessons from you know your your long history of doing this work so really really appreciate it um it's very special to have this conversation with you um we have about 15 minutes and i certainly have more questions but i wanted to um open it up if if there's anybody uh who's attending right now that has some questions that they want to throw into the chat um to ask Mike or Fred. So I'll I'll, I'll give it a second um, if anybody's type typing away anything. Um, I see John Ferreira raised raised a hand. Um, let me see. Um, we can turn on John Mike's uh, if, if uh, he wants to ask his question loud. Sounds good. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm, I'm very curious um, what you think is needed in the modern technological age to improve the process of powered research. If there's any ideas or pain points that um, now we basically have access to uh, different ways to approach this. I couldn't hear him, Derek. What was the question? So, John, if, if I got your question right, you were asking what, um, what are their thoughts about what is new in the in our new technological age that can help benefit power research? Is that essentially what you were asking? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, so what new technologies, what new things today are, are, are they, maybe that you didn't have in the past, do you see as most helpful in power research? You wanna go first, Mike, if you have any thoughts? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think there's anything unknown today, practically. I mean, the, abil the, abil the ability, given what, we had, and given what's available now, when I want to do research I can do in 15 minutes, which would have taken me three weeks. 
in, if, if, if I ever could find the answer uh, 50 years ago, but right now I can find, if I wanna research the Dominican Republic in sugar, uh, like I did back in 1965, 66. I mean, there's a world of material, English and Spanish on the internet, which is uh, astounding, uh, absolutely astounding. So I don't think it's a question of, can you find something out? It's a question of, can you make sense of it? And can you make people aware of why it's important? That's the challenge. Can you make sense of it? There's so much information, it's almost difficult to make sense of a lot of it, okay? And some of it's very conflicting information. Uh, that you can get on the internet, obviously. So your challenge is how to make sense of it and how to get it out to people so they can use it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to allow, I, I, I unmuted Beth, um, Beth Lyons, who um, I'm very happy is here. We also interviewed for our story and who was involved in a similar type of work at NYU. So welcome, welcome, Beth. Did you have a question or a comment? Um, I'm sorry, Derek. I just want to thank you and Mike and Fred um, for the presentation because I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I remember 106th Street office, so I don't have a question, but I just want to say thanks to all of you for doing this. It's great to have you here. Thanks. What's the, what's the question? It wasn't a question. It was oh. um, comment. Beth was, comment. Yeah, Beth was saying that she was very happy about the that we were able to do this, and she enjoyed it. Who was who was who was it? Beth Lyons. Uh huh. From NYU. Yes, that's right, Fred. NYU. Are there any other any other questions or um, thoughts or? Um, Discussion points. All right, I'm gonna. Yeah, we, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't mention that about 30 who rules came out of, uh, or were similar to what we produced around the United States. Somewhat, the count is somewhat around 30 at various universities. And obviously the student movement took up this methodology and used it uh, uh, voluminously to, uh, to educate their, their members about what was going on on their campuses. We had, uh, we sold, we got it out just a day or two before graduation, and we sold yeah. over a thousand copies graduation day. Yeah, one of the challenges, how do you get it out? There yeah. was no internet. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, uh, we have another question from the audience uh, from Jill Hamburg. I'm going to uh, uh, allow you to speak so you can ask your question. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, I thank Fred and um, Mike for their presentation. It was wonderful. And just wanted to add that um, uh, their research was also part of uh, not only a nexus of people at universities, but in communities, uh, research, right. uh, uh, independent research institutes that were, um, were doing research in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, not just on Latin America, but also Africa, Asia, the Middle East. Some of those still exist today. Um, so, and, and NACO played a very, very important role um, in that. Yeah, that's Jill Hamburg, who did a very important pamphlet on community power research in Boston, looking at the mostly real estate power structure, if I remember correctly, Jill. And that was a very important piece for SDS's uh, organizing efforts, ERAP organizing efforts in various cities in 1965, 66, 67. Um, well, I, I got involved in this initially doing research on landlords in, in Newark with a community organizing project in the mid 60s. But what I did write was a manual called Where It's At, a research guide for community organizing. And um, eventually it was reprinted and uh, sold about 40,000 copies. And I just came across a letter recently from that period where, where I say that the, the rumor is that um, people in VISTA, the anti-poverty program, um, uh, which refused to distribute it, but it was people there try to get it. And I think that's who wound up using a lot of it. Um, mm -hmm. and, 
So, but it didn't, it, it had a little chapter on research on power structure, but basically referred people to menace and other, other things, but it was more on what do you need to do, know if you're organizing um, folks on welfare, on um, consumer issues, on housing issues, um, and so on. Right, where it's at was a great, great resource for community organizing. Yeah, thank you very much, Jill. Um, it looks like, oh, and it, saw, it looks like Manera may, may have been able to find that and dump it into the chat, so. Um, uh, uh, it looks like we have two more uh, raised hands. Do we have time to get to, to two more questions, Derek? Yeah, we have about five more minutes, so I think okay. five, six um, more minutes. Seema, I'm gonna pass the mic to you. Okay. Hi, it's Sema Gorin. Um, I came in a bit late, uh, regret to say, but the chart looks interesting. I didn't catch how uh, contemporary it is and whether we could get it uh, in a larger form because it's very hard to read. Oh. So, um, so it's from 1968 and I... I don't know. I don't personally have a higher resolution version of it, but maybe Mike or yeah. Uh, did you? I'm sorry, but did you already discuss the power structure of Colombia? I think I might have missed the whole thing. Um, and is there a chart uh, for that to the contemporary power structure? Or were you just yeah. using it as an example of, of what happens to universities? Right. I don't know of any contemporary example that, that exists. It would be an interesting exercise, actually. But uh, no, I don't know of any current study that's been done on Columbia. Okay. Or of right. a university. I have a copy of this uh, chart, uh, Derek, and we can talk about how we might be able to make it uh, more accessible or more, I don't know how. It's, it's, it's a, it's, it was a foldout within the pamphlet. It was a large foldout. Three pages, I think it was three pages of uh, material, if I remember right, Craig? It was three pages? I think it was two. The fold out? Well, Did yeah. Two? Maybe two. Yeah. Thanks. So. Anyway, um, I have a copy of it. We can talk, we can talk about how to maybe, maybe reproduce it in a way that could be accessible. That you can't see that, obviously. It's quite okay, great. Um, so yeah, we, if we have time for one more question. Um, great, Doug. Um, I just unmuted you or gave you permission to talk, go for it. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, um, I'm from Oregon and uh, your presentation has a lot of relevance for me because I've been uh, battling our local university here dealing with uh, forestry issues. And what mm -hmm. we have on the West Coast is a situation where the public uh, institutions, our universities in Oregon have boards of trustees that were handpicked by the university presidents. And um, they refuse to even acknowledge questions that I've sent them month after month after month. <laughs> um, they won't put anything in writing. You know, it's it's just part of their standard process. They won't acknowledge questions. Um, we also have state two leading state newspapers that no longer will print letters to the editor as a standard policy because they've been bought up by Gannett Corporation. And so that makes mm. it incredibly difficult to even get a message out to the broader public. Um, one person recently told me, an insider, that our two options are legislative and judicial. He said you can file a lawsuit or you can get legislators to uh, assist you in your efforts to put pressure on them. And I'm just curious if you have any insight as, or experience with using judicial or legislative avenues to try to get pressure on university trustees. Uh, I would say I've had a lot of experience with that in terms of corporate campaigns and they're both very effective uh, methods. A good lawyer uh, can really open up a lot of uh, possibilities for you and information, uh, especially if they get standing and they can do uh, you know, information requests, uh, discovery in other words. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, legislature holding a hearing or getting a friendly Congress, a, a friendly representative to hold a hearing and has the power to request or demand information, again, 
from an institution is a very powerful weapon, a very powerful way of opening up sources of information. We've used that in the past several times at the state, local, and federal levels, and it's it's one that you should follow, you should pursue, definitely. You need a friendly legislature, legislator, and you need uh, them to be able to take the risk to put their neck on the line a little bit to go and get the information, but it can be done. Yes. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you again, um, Mike and Fred, thank you so much for this, this really, you know, special event. It was really just wonderful to, to, to talk to you and pick your brains and your memories a little bit about um, the story behind Who Rules Columbia and hear some, some of your, 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 um, yeah, just some of the, the lessons from your experience. I know this, this research that Little Sis does, um, you know, working with so many partners and um, you know such a, a big little cis community really really value this the the importance of power research and how it can support organizing efforts and so um we know we understand that we we stand on the shoulders of of other you know um you know many who who built who built this tradition you know before we 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 joined. So, um yeah thanks again and i also wanted to just say yeah if you know if you want to connect with Little Sis again, you can follow us on Twitter or Facebook. You can sign up for our newsletter. Uh, I think Manira is dumping some links in. There. And then um, also, you know, we're a non, you know, small nonprofit organization. Uh, and um, if you, you know, like events like this and like the work that we do, feel free to to throw a donation uh, our way. And um, I think Manira will put in a link for that. There we go to you. So. Um, Always appreciative of that. Um, but uh, with that, I will just, you know, once again say thank you so much to Mike and Fred. Thanks for everybody for, for joining us. Um, we hope to have more of these in the future. So if you sign up for the, the newsletter, uh, then we will, you'll certainly, and follow and keep, keep an eye on what Little Sis is doing. You'll certainly, you know, be, be informed of when the next one will be. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Wonderful job. Yeah. All right. Bye, everyone. Great job, Derek.